If you don't have a Bible, you can grab a pew Bible there in front of you and go to Luke chapter number 8. And uh, this morning we are going to look at a, a story that happened to Jesus Christ and his disciples. There's a couple different accounts in the Bible of them encountering really bad storms. They're different accounts, different storms. In fact, I covered one of them in February. It's the one where Jesus came walking on the water. This is a different storm and uh, that we're going to look at this morning in Luke chapter 8. Life does bring different types of storms, doesn't it? And uh, this morning we're going to look at a different storm that they encountered. Let's go to Luke chapter 8, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 22. It says, now it came to pass, verse 22, now it came to pass on a certain day that he, Jesus, went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, let us go over unto the other side of the lake, and they launched forth. And as they sailed, verse 23, and as they sailed, he, Jesus, fell asleep. Remember, Jesus came and humbled himself, became a man, took on our humanity. He was God, but he was also man. And as a man, he got tired. He fell asleep. You know, he would get physically worn out just like we do. And it says he fell asleep. Well, while he's asleep, notice there came down a storm of wind on the lake. And they were filled with water. The, the ship was filled with water and they were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him saying, Master, Master, we perish. And then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, what manner of man is this? For he commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. You know, storms are a part of life. We all go through them, every one of us in here. We could all stand up and we could all talk about the storms that we have been through. We can encounter literal storms like the hurricanes. We had three hurricanes one year here in Florida and many of you were here and you went through those literal storms. Some of you are from up north and you went through blizzards and you've been through ice storms. How many of you, are, how many of you have ever shoveled snow? Raise your hand. How many of you are glad to be in Florida? Say amen, amen. I'll take the heat, amen. I'm from the Midwest, lots of tornadoes, scary weather there, scary storms. But you know, you got the literal storms that you may go through, but then you got figurative storms. In other words, there's storms that are related to your job, storms that are related to your, your business, or maybe your marriage. You know, you got some storms that are kind of brewing big time in your marriage. You got storms in your family. Maybe your kids. You have storms in, in your relationships or in your finances or in your health or a loved one's health. And all of us in here can associate with that feeling. Uh, I mean, we live right here on the Atlantic Ocean, and you can look out at that vast ocean. It's, it's still mind-boggling to me every time I look at it, you know, and I see it every week, and yet it's mind-boggling to me when I look at the Atlantic Ocean and I, and I see the vastness of it. And sometimes you can feel like you are in the middle of that vast ocean, you're in a little canoe, and you got two oars. And man, that, that, that ocean is just tossing you all around out there. You can feel that way sometimes in life. Can you imagine how the disciples felt that day? It says that, that they were filled with water. That's serious. This has been going on now. I mean, the ship's filled with water, and they're in jeopardy, the Bible says. In Matthew 8, it tells the same story, and it says that their ship was covered with waves. This was one serious storm. They had a crisis on their hand, and a, a lot of us in here can identify with that, you know, when you're in crisis mode. Maybe today that's you. Maybe life storms are just pounding your soul today, and you feel like, man, I'm not going to make it. I'm going to sink, and I'm going to go under. What should a person do? How do we handle the storms that come our way in life? Storms can, can literally, they can, they can make you or break you. And so how do you handle them? How do you deal with them? How do you survive them? How do you survive them? I want to share with you some principles today from this story that I believe will be a huge help to you if you let it. And the first thing is this, number one is this, before the storm ever gets there, before the storm, make sure Jesus is in the boat. 
make sure Jesus is in the boat. Amen. How many of you would, be, would agree it would be a good idea to have him in the boat? Amen. The disciples did not know it, but their survival was due to the fact that Jesus Christ was in the boat with them. Is Jesus on board with you? Now, I'm speaking figuratively right now, but I think you get the idea. In other words, the idea is, have you accepted Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life? Are you a believer? Because the Bible teaches that once you trust Jesus Christ to be your Savior, that he comes to live inside of you. And Jesus Christ it has done everything necessary for your eternal uh, home in heaven, for you to live eternally, for you to have a home in heaven with him. He's done everything necessary uh, for, for you to enjoy the forgiveness of all your sins, all the skeletons in your closet, all the things you don't even want to think about that you've done, all the bad things. He paid the price for those. When he died on the cross, he was making a full payment that you and I should have had to pay, but he made the payment for us on the cross. There, the Bible says, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. There, as the hymn says, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He has done everything necessary in order to save you, to give you his life, to give you eternal life, to give you a home in heaven. And I want you to know, friend, that in order to know that, that, that you are saved, in order to know that your sins are forgiven, I want you to know that it's not going to happen by you joining this church. It's not going to happen through religion. It's not going to happen by you being baptized. I had a dear lady that came back after the 815 service this morning. And she said, you know, I've really been seeking God. I really wasn't raised up with it. And I, but I've really been seeking God. And she said, I've come to your church a few times. And she wanted to know Jesus Christ. She said, you know, I've, I've been to churches and they've, they've told me I need to be baptized by them. Or I need to go through this ritual or that and do this and that. And I said, man, I got great news for you. I said, Jesus Christ has already done it all. And I am so glad to be able to tell you that that lady talked to Miss Colette McGuire. And today she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. Today she knows, amen, praise God, that she's going to heaven. And, and you know, friend, listen, Jesus has done everything necessary. He made a full payment. And after they crucified him on the cross where he made a payment for our sins, then three days later, he rose from the dead, proving that he was who he said he was. His grave is now empty. But you know, whether you are saved or whether you are not saved, everybody encounters storms as they travel through this life on a sin-cursed earth. Nobody is immune from storms. Nobody. Christians are not immune. Non-Christians are not immune. It doesn't matter what church you go to. It doesn't matter what your family history is. Everybody goes through storms. Doesn't matter if you're rich. Doesn't matter if you're poor. Doesn't matter if you live in the nicest neighborhood in town. Doesn't matter if you live in the poorest neighborhood in town. Everybody goes through storms during this life. And you know, Pastor Clemp uh, has done a good job on Sunday nights talking about the problem of pain. Why is there pain in the world? Why is there pain in our personal lives? Why is there uh, the, the tragedies that happen, like what we saw with the man who wrote, it is well with my soul? Well, the Bible is very clear that it's not God's fault. The Bible teaches us that when sin entered the world, when mankind chose to go Satan's way instead of God's way, it sent this earth into a tailspin. It brought the curse of sin upon this earth. And the Bible says that we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And Paul said, not only they, but ourselves also. You see, not only are even the elements of creation under the curse of sin and pain, but he says, we're not immune from that either. We as Christians also are going to encounter storms. Why? Because we live on a sin-cursed earth. And you know, there's a verse in Job chapter 14, verse 1, and, and it's kind of funny the way he words it. He says, man that is born of a woman. I don't know of any other way to be born, do you? And so he's being kind of tongue-in-cheek. The Bible is such a great book. It does that. It'll say things tongue-in-cheek like that. And he says, man that is born of a woman. How many of you, that's you, raise your hand. Some of you didn't raise your hand. You flew in on a flying saucer, I guess, right? But man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. <laughs> 
And it's true. What he's saying is nobody's immune from storms. We're all going to go through storms. So the issue is not whether or not you're going to go through storms. That, is, that, that issue's settled. Until we get to heaven, storms are a part of this earth. Until Christ one day returns, as the hymn writer wrote, it is well, and, and he talked about the return of Christ. Until that happens, God is still giving grace to people to be saved. But that also means that we're in an imperfect world and that there are going to, there's going to be pain. There's going to be storms. Either you, here's the issue though. It's not whether or not you're going to go through storms. Here's the issue. Either you're going to go through the storm with Christ or without Christ. You see, if you have believed on him, the Bible teaches that the spirit of Christ dwells in you. Colossians 1 27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then, and this is what I love, is that the Bible says in Hebrews 13 and verse number seven, it said, or, or verse number five, it says that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Once Jesus Christ lives in your heart, once he's in the boat, man, he is not going to bail ship. Aren't you thankful that he is with, it's just what we sung, he is with us through every storm of life. You say, Pastor Dan, my life is good. I have no storms. I don't expect any storms. And I don't need Jesus. I got smooth sailing. And my answer to that would be buckle your seatbelt because a storm's probably brewing. Friend, I got news for you. Even if you were to not to have one painful thing happen to you on this earth, even if you were to not ever encounter one storm while going through this earth, every single one of us will all eventually encounter a storm called death. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto men once to die. Every one of us will encounter a storm called death. And it doesn't matter. I said at Elva Jean's funeral yesterday, a dear precious lady in our church, Elva Jean Valentine, she went home to be with Jesus Christ. She knew the Lord, man. She loved Jesus. And Elva Jean, I mentioned at her funeral yesterday, I said, you know, it doesn't matter how much medicine you take. It don't matter how many vitamins you take. It don't matter how many miles a day you jog. Guess what? We're all going to die. We all have an appointment with death. Every one of us. <laughs> I read something funny. I thought it's, it's supposed to be like an obituary. It's meant to be kind of humorous. You'll see why in a minute. But it, the guy's obituary said, the doctors examined him twice a year. He wore boots when it rained. He slept with the windows open to get fresh air. He stuck to a diet with plenty of fresh vegetables and fruits. He golfed, but never more than 18 holes at a time, so he didn't overdo it. He got at least eight hours of sleep every night. He never smoked, never drank, never lost his temper. He did his exercises every day, and he was all set to live to be 100 years old. His funeral will be held this Wednesday. And it says he is survived by 18 specialists, four health institutes, six gyms, and numerous manufacturers of health foods and antiseptics. And it said he made just one mistake. He forgot God. You see, that man is like many people in our world. They think about the body, and they think about enjoying the pleasures of this life, but they forget all about the fact that someday they're going to die. Then what? When you go through that storm of death, the Bible talks about the valley of the shadow of death. When you go through that storm of death, there's only one way to come out of it alive, and that's to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. In 1 John 5, 11 and 12, it's on the front of your handout. I want you to look at that passage with me. It says, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Nobody should want to face the storms of life. Nobody should want to face the storm of death without Christ in the boat. Where would the disciples have been without Christ in the boat? They would have been at the bottom of the sea drowned, I believe. So my question to you is this, why don't you, if you don't know God today, why don't you accept Jesus Christ today as your Lord and Savior? 
Come to him today. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He'll go with you through every storm. He was with Horatio Spafford through those storms. He'll be with you. Christian, Christ doesn't bail ship. He's with you through the storm. And I'll say one more thing. Christian, the time to build up your faith in Christ is before you encounter the storm. Sometimes what happens is when things are good in our life, we tend to, to, to drift away. We're not faithful. We, we don't read our Bible. We're not seeking God. We're not really growing. Everything's hunky-dory. Everything's great. And then the storm comes and all of a sudden we're scrambling. Why? Because we didn't build up our faith before the storm came. The time to build up your faith is before the storm ever comes. If right now you say, my, my life, Pastor Dan, is storm-free. I got no storms. I mean, it is, it's blue skies right now. You know what? That's the time you need to draw close to God and build up your faith. So that when the storm comes, you'll be ready. It's like if, if we knew a Hurricane 5 was coming, that's the worst hurricane. If we knew a Hurricane 5 was going to hit Daytona, you know, in a few days, and you got people out and they're boarding up their windows, and they're buying water, and they're getting flashlights, and they're getting batteries, and you notice your neighbor, he's sitting out in his lawn chair just grinning. And you go over and you say, hey, man, all right, you know there's a storm coming. And, uh, hey, listen, uh, uh, are you going to board up your windows? And he says, no. No, I'm not going to board him up. You, well, why not? There's a Hurricane 5 that's going to hit in a couple days. He says, well, I just thought, if I thought, you know, once the storm hits, yeah, during the storm, if I need to, I'll board him up. Well, aren't you going to get water and flashlights? Well, if, it, if, if I need to during the storm, I'll, I'll go get it. I'll go get some water, you know. What's the problem with that? Well, once the storm hits, it's what? It's too late. It's too late once it hits. The time to build your faith is now if you're storm free. Because you want to build up your faith before the storm hits. That way when the storm hits, you're ready. You're prepared. See? You're not trying to scramble. You're ready for that thing. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But let me give you the second point. Number two. We said number one, make sure Christ is in the boat before the storm. During the storm... The second point is, drop the bucket and go to the master. Drop the bucket and go to the master. You say, what are you talking about? Well, let me explain. In our text, the fact that the ship was filled with water, look at verse number 23. It says, and as they sailed, he fell asleep, and there came down a storm of wind on the lake. They were filled with water and were in jeopardy. Now, I want you to think with me for a minute. If the boat, if the ship is filled with water, as the Bible says, then that leads us to assume the disciples did not turn to Christ right away when the storm first hit. Had they done it, the ship wouldn't have been full of water. Can't you just see them? I mean, I can. They're out here on, on this sea, and they got their buckets. And man, I mean, they're going to town. They're scooping up water in their buckets, and they're trying to take care of this storm in their own power and in their own strength. And they're frantically got their buckets trying to get this water out of the ship, feverishly trying to work this thing out in their own strength. Finally, finally, things get so bad, somebody gets a really great idea. Let's go get Jesus. <laughs> and the other 11 disciples must have looked at whoever came up with that idea and went, that's the best idea I've heard all day. They dropped their buckets and went and got Jesus. They sought Christ. And you know, it's, it's hilarious, really. They drop their buckets, they seek Jesus, and here you have experienced fishermen, men of the sea, going to a carpenter for help in a storm. Kind of funny, huh? And they get there, and this is hilarious to me, they run frantically to go get Jesus, drop their bucket, go get Jesus, and I love it. He's sawing logs. He's sawing logs, man. He is sound asleep. I mean, that is so hilarious to me. Look down at verse number 24. It says, uh, it says, and they came to him and awoke him 
I mean, he wasn't just like down there just kind of sitting on the bed wondering, okay, I wonder when they're going to come seek me. He's out cold. He's asleep. They got to wake him up. And that is hilarious to me. I mean, they're out here and they're bailing water just as fast as they can and he is sound asleep. Anybody in here sound sleepers? How many of you could sleep through anything? Raise your hand. Man, I tell you, my wife gets so aggravated with me. We'll have a crisis in the middle of the night, and she says, you are no help at all. I mean, when I'm out, I'm out. I don't hear anything. Uh, she, she claims, and I believe her, she says, I've had entire conversations with people in the middle of the night, and I have no memory of it the next day at all. So really, the moral of that story is, if you have a crisis in the middle of the night and you call our house, you want to talk to her, all right? Not me. She can't get me up. I'm such a sound sleeper. You know, she'll hear something and, and I'm out, you know? And of course, I used to feel bad about it. Now I just tell her, you know, after studying this, well, I'm just being Christ-like, amen? Just being Christ-like. But isn't it great to have a Savior who is not wringing his hands up in heaven when you're going through a storm? He's not wringing his hands. He's all powerful. And he does not fret. In your handout, it says the way of faith is to realize that Christ is the only answer to our storms. He wants us to learn that while we may be able to row ourselves out, who knows if they'd have been able to, it's much better if we turn to Christ first. As I've said many times before, you turn to Christ as your first resource not your last resort. In your handout, it says, don't try and ride the storm out in your own strength. Turn to him. Trust him. Depend on him. You know what God really wants? God wants a people who trust him no matter what. A people who walk by faith, not by sight. So figuratively speaking, drop the bucket and go to Jesus. Drop the bucket and flee to him. Drop the bucket and rely on Christ during the storm. Let's talk about after the storm. Number three, after the storm is over, there's a calm. Here's the principle. You ready? It comes right from the passage. Here's the principle. Grow because of the storm. Don't waste your storms. You say, what do you mean, Pastor Dan? Don't waste your storms. Let them grow you as a believer. Let them grow you as a person. You see, storms in life have the ability to make you bitter or make you better. It's your choice. You can either get bitter or get better. Let the storms of life grow you. After the storm was all over and there was calm and, and, and you know, things finally calmed down, Jesus asks the disciples a very simple, very direct question. I love the way Jesus would just kind of, he gets to the heart of the matter. I love it. You know, Christ was so wise. And, and he looks at him. Look at the verse there, verse number 25. And he said unto them, this was his question, where is your faith? Do you know what he's wanting them to do right there, church? He wants them to reflect on the situation that they just went through. He wants them to reflect on that storm, and he wants them to examine their own hearts and examine their own personal faith. Was it where it should be? Well, they did turn to Christ, but not right away. And when they finally did turn to Christ, it was kind of in fear and desperation. Ah, we're going we're gonna to die. You know, they, they didn't turn to him with trust. So there was a lot for them to learn through this. And he said, guys, where is your faith? That's a great question. Where is your faith? Where, what, what level is your faith? Where are you at? In your handout, it says the storms of life provide a wonderful test to see exactly where we are in our walk with Christ. Now, I want to reiterate what Pastor Clint said last Sunday night and the Sunday night before. When I say that statement, I don't want you to get the idea that God is sending storms into your life on purpose and just to test you. That we saw, Clint showed us from the Bible, that's not the case, all right? Storms, God doesn't have to send storms into your life. They're a natural built-in part of this earth. Storms are going to come regardless. 
I mean, that's part of this sin-cursed earth that we live on. That's a result of mankind's sin. That's, that, that's a result of plant, being on planet earth where Satan's the god of this world. And so storms are going to come. So God's not up in heaven orchestrating storms to send into your life. No, they're going to come very naturally. But when those storms do come in your life, and they will, those storms are going to end up giving you a pretty good barometer of where you are in your walk with Christ. Are you fearful or are you trusting? Do you worry or do you pray? Are you growing or are you stagnant? Is your faith little faith, or do you have a strong faith? Is your faith in what you can do, or is your faith in what Christ can do in and through you? Do you tend to believe the lies of Satan when you go through a storm? That would show little faith, because Satan will give you lies when you go through storms. He'll tell you Christ doesn't care. He'll tell you, oh, God's mad at you. He'll say, oh, God's unfair, and he's not just. Satan will say lies to you like, well, you know, God's getting even with you. He'll say things to you like, yeah, you know, this is all God's fault. We won't blame God for it. And Satan will give us all these lies. Do we believe them? See, that's the question. And that, that's what I'm saying. When you go through a storm, you kind of find out where you're at. How strong your faith is or how weak it is. I mean, we, we saw where Horatio Spafford, we saw about his faith, didn't we? I mean, you couldn't go through. I mean, Light loses his son, loses all investments, loses his four little girls. And, and we saw exactly those, those, that's, those storms that he went through really told us a lot about him. And as we examine our heart, it's an opportunity for us to grow spiritually, to see the areas that we need to mature in. Storms have a way of bringing to the surface what's in the heart. (laughs) You have a storm at work, find out what's in your heart. You know, as long as everything's going your way, anybody can handle that. What about when things don't go your way? You find out what's in your heart, don't you? When the storms of life come in your marriage, you find out where each other's faith is. You find out where you're at. See, when this storm was all over, Jesus said... Where's your faith? Where's your faith? Where are you at? Where are you guys at? Strong faith, little faith? And you know, it's interesting that when this was over, look what they said. Look at verse number 25. And he said unto them, where is your faith? And they being afraid wondered, saying to one another, what manner of man is this? For he commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. I, I, you know, when we read the Bible, sometimes we read through stuff like that real fast, and we don't really get the inflection. We don't, we're not seeing it like on a video screen, so we're not really getting the shock. I mean, you understand these guys have almost lost their life. They have seen a storm like they have never been through in their life. And all of a sudden, he comes out, and, and with one or two words, he completely calms the storm they obey the winds and waves obey him and they are completely flabbergasted and their jaw is on the ground and they are like what matter of man is this he commands even the wind and the water and they obey him they did not know as much about Jesus as they thought they knew and storms have a way of showing us how much more we need to learn and how much more we need to grow. You know, we may think that we know a lot about Christ. We think we know a lot about the Bible. And then a storm comes and all of a sudden we realize how little we really know. And there are deep waters to cross with the Lord that we haven't crossed yet. And as we cross those waters, we begin to learn things that, man, I, ne- I didn't even realize that about God. I never knew that about my Savior. Wow, that's good, you know, and, and, and after the storm is a time when you can really grow because of the storm. These guys knew more about Christ after having come through the storm. They knew Christ in a deeper way. Church, listen, the same was true of the Apostle Paul, man who wrote 13 books of the Bible. He had, a, a, he had an infirmity in his flesh. He asked the Lord to heal him. He didn't get healed. And you know what he said? He said, you know, 
one of the things I've learned through this storm is that when I'm weakest, he's the strongest. And I've learned that to take pleasure in the storms of life because he said, I have found that that's when the power of Christ can really rest upon me. And you think about that, you think, wow, Paul grew because of the storm. And listen, storms are going to come in your life. Before the storm ever hits, make sure Christ is in the boat and then make sure you're growing your faith in him before the storm ever hits so you're ready. But then when you're in the storm, when you're in the midst of it, and some of you, that's you now, you're right in the middle of a storm. When you're in the middle of that storm, drop the bucket and turn to Jesus. Rely upon him. But after the storm is over, once there's that calm, in your handout it says, don't waste your storms. Don't waste your storms. Allow the storms of life to reveal more to you about yourself, about your walk with the Lord, and allow the storms of life to reveal more to you about Christ and who he is.